Okay, well, we're going to read up. This isn't a fun sermon, so for those of you who are guests, I don't apologize because it's the Word of God, but I apologize. You don't know what you're in for. Please stand for the reading of the Word. We're doing a little bit of a cover of what we covered the last two weeks to put it in context. This is Acts chapter 4 through 5, 11. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there, was, there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I'll bet. You may be seated. I don't know if you've noticed, but Christianity has a bit of a credibility problem these days. Christians are held up as objects of ridicule, not necessarily for what they believe, but for what they are doing. In a recent Barna poll, less than half of unbelieving Americans see pastors as a trustworthy source of wisdom. Many Americans, including one in five Christians, admit feeling unsure whether pastors are even trustworthy. The most common reason unbelievers give for not going to church is because the church is full of, that's right, the church is full of hypocrites. It's a sad state when that comment becomes more and more true, evidenced by the daily reporting of yet another Christian leader falling, another scandal exposed, another lie revealed. One of the original founders of the seeker-friendly movement, perhaps you're familiar with that, that was founded around the 90s, uh, his name is Bill Hybels, and he had a mega church in Chicago. Well, he resigned amid allegations of inappropriate activity with women that spanned decades, decades. Ravi Zacharias was a renowned and beloved global evangelist who had the reputation as a man who gave a clear and articulate defense of Christianity. The impact of Ravi Zacharias' international ministries was incalculable due to his strong influence in apologetic circles. He was a brilliant thinker. Well, all that came crashing down last year after his death when it was discovered that he lived a secret private life that was filled with the abuse of perhaps hundreds of women. Christian historian David Barton lied on camera that he had earned a doctorate degree when he hadn't. And his history books about the founding father's faith have been proven false many times. 
An anti-Christian website called xchristian.net said this, to all X non christians and all others reading this who feel they are disappointed or confused by the amount of ignorance, lies, perversion, and confusion that is rapidly overtaking much of the Christian world today. I understand much of your heartaches, and I'm a Christian. I haven't been going to a church religiously for many years now. We are at a time where we are experiencing abominations that are causing desolation due to the enemy within. This guy is pretty bitter, understandably so. Many are. But the enemy within first showed his ugly face in the church way back in the book of Acts. A couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira were the church's first big famous hypocrites. And let me clarify something. The name is Ananias, not Anais. You're welcome. But before Ananias and Sapphira could write a book about their public repentance and comeback, before they shed crocodile tears in front of the news cameras, and before they could strike a lucrative movie deal and a Nike endorsement, God put an end to them by striking them dead on the spot. I was preaching about 2002 at my other church, and it was during worship service a guy died in the back row. It was during we were singing praises, and the guy just dies. And it's like, you talk about interrupting a service, right? Oh, yeah. It was, people are gathered around him. The guy's dead. They couldn't bring him back to life. The paramedics came, and they carted him off. Sad thing was, I heard this older man, he was an older man, he was living with his girlfriend. And who knows, who knows? But I'll never forget that. It was one of the most miserable weekends of my life because that's when my daughter also got scratched by a feral cat and we had to rush her to the hospital. It was a pretty bad weekend. Never forget it. People this day, when those two people died in the church, they didn't forget that either. But this passage is a warning to all those who would play the game of church. It's a caution to those who are living a hypocritical life as a Christian. It's also a solemn reminder that God cannot be mocked. He takes sin seriously and will guard jealously the purity of his church. The tragic story of this couple is set against the backdrop of a loving, caring, giving fellowship of believers in the early church. We already saw how giving and loving they were. We covered that the last few weeks. They shared everything they had. Those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, it was distributed to anyone who had need. It was loving and gracious, and nobody had any needs. People were so generous, they were just selling property and donating it to the early church. Then an example is given of a very generous man named Joseph. Verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. That's pretty awesome. Barnabas, by the way, we had a generous couple donate the 10 acres of land that this church is on back in 1982. Isn't that pretty awesome? Barnabas was a great example from among those donating property. He gave out of love, not to be prideful or acknowledge, but out of the simple pleasure of giving. Simple pleasure of giving. Now, how long could this loving, evangelizing, giving church keep up the pace? Sadly, not too much longer. The first recorded sin in the church was about to take place with dire consequences. Verses 1 and 2. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. In direct contrast to the good example of sharing set by Barnabas, we now get the bad example. Ananias, which means God is gracious, and his wife Sapphira, which means beautiful, saw an opportunity to make a double profit by deceit. How so? Well, they'd get praise from people by appearing to be big givers. Wow, look at that. They're, they're taking the sale of their land and they're donating the whole sale to the church. They could also make a little money on the side giving it all away. They loved their money. They made their sale. 
and looked at all that dough, and they couldn't bear the thought of giving it all away, so they kept some back. Now, you have to understand, Ananias and Sapphira had the right to keep whatever they wanted. They didn't have to give the whole profit. They didn't have to give the whole sale of the land to the church, but they appeared that they were giving the whole amount, and that's sin. They lied. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Ananias and Sapphira had a hypocritical faith that relied on appearances, a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now, our English language is very strange. There's no ham in a hamburger. There's no egg in an eggplant. There's no butter in buttermilk, no apple in pineapple. Quicksand is very slow, and if you notice, boxing rings are square. There should be no such inconsistency with those who call themselves Christians. If we say we follow Christ, we must actually follow Christ. Our words and actions must match the name we profess. I'm telling you, when I'm studying for this sermon, I'm I'm thinking, Lord, is there anything I need to confess? I am a hypocrite. I confess I'm a hypocrite. I sin, but I'm not in any willful, continual, awful sin that I'm holding back from you. And if I was, trust me, Bill would figure it out somehow. No, I want to live authentically. We need to live authentically. We need to live authentically. Our faith isn't about appearances. It's about authenticity. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. It's not about what I think of you or the person sitting next to you thinks of you. It's what God thinks of you that matters. And I want to suggest that too many Christians go through the motions. They come to church. They may sing a few songs, but their heart isn't in it. They may endure the teaching, but they leave unaffected. God's given them lots of wealth, but they give nothing. Then what's the point of coming to church? because you've always gone to church? One part of me wants to say, you know what, if that's how you feel, stay at home. But another part of me says, no, come, because the word of God never returns empty. So at some point in time, you may be a hypocrite, you may be a fake Christian, you may not be walking the walk at all, but by preaching the word, God can grab a hold of your heart. So I say, if you're that kind of Christian, and I don't know who is and who isn't, keep coming, keep coming. It's between you and God. Now, Ananias wasn't concerned with what God thought, and he suffered the consequences, didn't he? Verses 3 and 4. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Can you imagine Ananias' face when he heard this rebuke from Peter? He's standing there with a self-satisfied grin on his face, ready to bask in the glory that he thought would be his because of his generous giving. Then in front of everyone, what? He's called out on the carpet? Peter asks how it was that Satan had so filled his heart. Ananias was not filled with the spirit of God, but with the spirit of Satan, just like everyone who is not a born-again believer. Did you know that? Those who are not born-again believers, they're followers of Satan, whether they know it or not. So Ananias was filled not with the spirit of God, but with the spirit of Satan, and Satan had gotten control over this man's life somehow, or... Maybe Satan already had this man's life. We don't really know. Was Ananias a believer or a false convert? We don't really know, do we? But mark this. A believer who continues to live in sin is indistinguishable from an unbeliever. They are both disobedient to God. 1 John 2 says this, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. 
But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So if you're wondering if that person who continually swears and is getting drunk on the weekends and on Monday, who has questionable business practices but faithfully goes to, the, goes to church, oh, I wonder if he's a Christian. You don't need to wonder. It's pretty simple. Now, we don't make the ultimate judgment. Only God knows the heart. We are, but we are called to judge the fruit. We know that we've come to, come to know him if we keep his commands. If they say, I know Jesus, but they're not living like they know Jesus, chances are they don't know. Only God knows. I can't say whether you're saved or not saved. I can say, look at your life. Still smoking pot, still doing drugs, still getting drunk, dancing naked every Sunday at the, on the bar tops in Dripping Springs where you think no one will see you? I didn't see you. I heard it. Only God knows. But it is a warning to every one of us to examine our lives, right? Don't just think this applies to the other person. It applies to me. It applies to all of us. It's pretty clear. If you say you are a follower of Christ, you must follow Christ. It makes no difference if you walked down an aisle and said a prayer 5, 10, or 20 years ago. You know, that doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It can make a difference, but if that's all you're relying on to say that you are a believer in Christ, come on, girls. It's important. It's important, okay? It's important. If you said a prayer 5, 10, and 20 years ago, it doesn't matter how much good stuff you've done in the name of the Lord doesn't matter how many ministries you've been involved with or how much money you've given. Are you following Christ now? Being a Christian is never based solely on a decision made in the past. It's also based on our walk in the present. So here's the question for every one of us. Are you walking the walk? Are you walking the walk? That's a question for you and God to decide. Did Ananias backslide, or was it that he never slid forward in the first place? Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Pretty simple. If you are in a backslidden condition right now, repent. If you're not sure you're saved, repent. Don't bank on God's grace to get you into heaven if you're living like hell. You must finish well. This goes for the young people, too, in here. We have on the first Sunday of the month the young people sitting in with us. And this goes for you as well. Consider, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you are accountable now. You are accountable now. Do you know the Lord? And do you know that you're going to heaven? Have you given your life to Jesus yet? I'm looking specifically at the young people. That's for you to decide. Jesus said, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Paul said, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. In 1 Timothy, he says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. In other words, this, stand firm. Don't nothing move you. Continue to press on, because this is real. This Christian life is more real than life itself because when we die, we go to heaven eternally. Right now, you are practicing for heaven. Right now, you're worshiping with just a portion of those you'll be worshiping with in heaven for eternity. Why are you messing around? Why are you messing around? Put your whole heart into this thing. Because Jesus put his whole heart, his whole life, into this thing, into you. After Peter rebukes Ananias for lying to God, God's judgment then hits him. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. You know, my, 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 my big desire is that I die at around age 90. And as I'm preaching a hellfire and brimstone message, kind of like today, I fall down dead. Wouldn't that be an illustration that you'd always remember? (laughs) 
The Bible says that there's a sin that leads to death. Ananias' lying was apparently that type of sin. Not that you're going to lie and go to hell. This is an object lesson, by the way. It's an object lesson. They're showing that when you come to church, you ought to be serious. There's time for joy and rejoicing, of course. And yes, you can have fun and crack jokes and all that. But when we're listening to the word of God and taking communion, I try to warn you, do this seriously. Because Paul says that's why some of you have fallen asleep and some of you are ill. Because you just take the Lord's Supper and you just drink it like it's, like it's an, an appetizer. But this is the word of God being preached to you. And if you're not a believer, it doesn't mean much, but it's still the word of God and it's doing something in your heart. But how much more for believers to listen? God moved quickly to remove the spiritual cancer. It was his divine judgment. If Ananias was a believer, God disciplined him severely, wouldn't you say? And by the way, God disciplines believers fact that's how you know you're loved by God if you're being disciplined according to Hebrews chapter 12 because it says what father did not discipline their son when they were disobedient so if you're disobedient and you find sometimes that can come through financial problems it can come through illness sometimes it's just plain old we just get sick and but anytime let me put it this way any inconvenience any type of problem, any kind of trial, consider it discipline. Consider it discipline, plain and simple. It may not be specifically something you've done, but certainly you can think it back and go, you know, Lord, I need to tighten up my walk. I need to do this. I need to be more faithful, maybe come into church. Maybe I need to start reading the word. I'm calling myself this, but I'm not doing any of it. The Bible says there's a sin that leads to death. 1 Peter 4, 17. By the way, we are to judge one another. Did you know that? Oh, don't judge. You hear that nowadays. Oh, let them live. It's their truth. How many, how, many, how many of you have heard that? Oh, it's their truth. It's my truth. No, there's one truth. 1 Peter says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So if God disciplines his children, what about those who don't believe? You know what happens to those who don't believe. The result of this judgment from God upon Ananias was that great fear seized all who heard what had happened. If there were no consequences following this act of sin, people would have believed that the Holy Spirit could be deceived and that dishonesty was profitable. God set the course straight, showing that he would not tolerate such foolishness. Boom, dead in the front row. Rex, go pick that guy up. Great fear seized Rex. <laughs> Can you imagine if God disciplined his church like that today? A lot of the foolishness, irreverence, half-heartedness, and hypocrisy would severely whittle down the church. Look at what COVID did. Not to our church. During COVID, our church doubled in size, but all the rest of the churches, 30 to 50%. That's all it took. A little flu bug. And they stopped coming to church. The American church is asleep, if not dead, and needs a wake-up call. A healthy dose of fear reminding them of who God is is what every church requires. You know, I don't preach like this very often, but this is where it's at in the word. Too many people who call themselves Christians mock God and shame his name because of their hypocrisy. Is it any mystery why the church is not taken seriously? You know why the country is the way it is? Because Christians haven't stood up. They haven't stood up for Christ and they've allowed, allowed lies They've allowed evil to become the norm. We're in a bubble in Johnson City. We all know that, right? We're in a bubble. Too many people have just let untruth run rampant in a society. Is there any confusion about why sinners don't flock to our folds with fervor? 
You know why? Why would they come to the church? They're all a bunch of hypocrites there. We must choose to be authentic. We have to choose to be authentic. Again, not sinless perfection. No one can do that. But take your life seriously with God. Confess you don't read your Bible. Confess you don't want to go to church. Confess you're bored. Confess you hate the pastor who's preaching these kind of sermons. Confess your sin to him. It's a real relationship. Don't just go through the motions and bring the family and sit down and leave unchanged. The point of this message and the point of every message is that you leave changed. You leave with something. Take a look at your notes real quick. Pull your notes out of your bulletin. Take take them out of your bulletin real quick. Look at the last question of your notes. It's in green. What's the last question in your notes? What's it say? There you go. That's going to be in every note. But most people don't even look at the notes. I was considering just putting like one sentence on each page of the notes because nobody really, nobody really takes them home. That's a devotional for you. It's for you to reflect on the word because we come and meet on Wednesday and no one remembers anything that I preached. And hey, I'm the same way. If I don't take notes or pay attention, take this and talk to your family about it. You've got little ones. Explain to them in a way they can understand so they don't grow up to be a hypocrite like you. Again, I don't know who is or who isn't. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That means according to their bent. It's not a guarantee that when they confess Christ as a little one, they're going to continue to walk. But you've done all that you can to raise them up in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. So when they grow up, they don't become like these kooks burning down buildings and stealing, saying, we're owed this. Live authentically because eternity is at stake. Your kids are at stake. Or you're raising them up like the world so they'll die and go to hell. That's what you're doing if you're not investing in them now. And then if you've done everything you can and they still walk away, hey, you've done your part. You've done your part. I love Kareem being here. Look at that. The fruit, I hate to embarrass you. I know I don't mind embarrassing because I just think it's so great you came down to take care of mom. And dad, dad needs care too, a little bit. But it's wonderful. You see in her countenance just a one, a woman who loves God. And same with their son. They still talk about Chris Ferron because he led young life here. Sometimes we aren't so fortunate. We can raise our kids in the way they should go and they go a whole different direction. So it is work. We have one example, right? Raise your kids up. Men, if you're the head of your household, lead your family. But you can't lead your family unless you spend time with the Lord. I'm going to come up with a little flyer that I'm putting in the back. It's going to be in the bulletin again on how to have a 10-minute quiet time. It's so important to me. It's so important to you. 10 minutes a day with the Lord is not enough, but that's a good start. Then you go and you come home and you read the Bible to your kids for 10 minutes and pray and talk about it. Then when you go to sleep, husbands, you... Put your hand on your wife. Tell her how much you love her. Read a psalm to her and pray a 10-second blessing like this. Dave, here's an example. Lord, thank you for faith. She's a wonderful wife. I love her so much. I commit her to you. May she have a good night's sleep. Amen. So you're committing a whole half an hour a day to your spiritual health and your kid's spiritual health and your wife's spiritual health. You will find out that's not enough time and that's the point. But you got to start somewhere. If you're a head of the household, lead your family. I'm discipling five men right now, and I am going to disciple five more if I have to. But the main thing we're talking about is a quiet. Right, Brandon? And every time he comes in, how'd you do? How'd you do? David, how you doing, right? How you doing? And I don't take excuses anymore. There's no reason we can't spend 10 minutes with the Lord in the morning. Everyone has the same 24 hours a day. If you get up at 645, guess what? Get up at 635. Spend 10 minutes with the Lord. You'll find out it's woefully inadequate. And that's the point. But I digress. When will we finally throw away the what would Jesus do bracelets and start doing what Jesus did? Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And Ananias thought he could get away with his deception and mock the Holy Spirit, but God killed him. Verse 6, 
Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. Pharaoh had to be quick due to the hot climate of Palestine. His sin was stinky enough without the added aroma of a rotting body in the church. But that's not all. That's not all. Listen to this, and this closes out this passage. Verse 7. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Ananias and Sapphira discredited and dishonored the entire Trinity. How? Verse 3 says they lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, they lied not to men but to God. Verse 9 says that they tested the Lord. It's not wise to test the Spirit of the Lord. You know that? How many remember that ad for margarine? You remember that? What was the margarine? It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Boom! And then whoever the lightning strikes, people over 50 remember that one. <laughs> you young people don't know what I'm talking about. It's not wise to test the spirit of the God to see how much you can get away with before God bring down, brings down the hammer. I'm going to just keep testing him until he brings down the hammer. I had a pastor who said he was purposely disobeying God and he was asked, what do you think God's going to do? He says, I think he's going to break my ankle. Really? So he told the story. He continued to disobey God. He's kicking a soccer ball in the parking lot of a grocery store and he tripped over one of the little curb markers and he broke his ankle. And I'm telling you, that, that scared me because I was ready to file bankruptcy and God was telling me not to file bankruptcy. This is when I was a brand new Christian and I didn't file bankruptcy after hearing that story. Not wise to test the spirit of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said this, 150 years ago, listen to this, 150 years ago, they wander in on a Sunday morning, sit down, get their hymn books, listen to the prayer without joining in it, hear the sermon, but might almost as well not have heard it, go home, get through the Sunday, go into business. With them, there is never any secret prayer for the conversion of men. No trying to talk to children or servants or friends of Christ. No zeal, no holy jealousy, no flaming love, no generosity, this is too faithful a picture of a vast number of professing Christians. Would it not be so? So you see, nothing has changed in 150 years, right? Same thing. And so it is that the Holy Spirit is discredited in the church today. Some people come to worship and operate totally on the human level, never even dealing with the living presence of God in this room. The passage closes with this. Great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. You bet. The whole church and all who heard about these events. The benefit of church discipline is that it keeps others from sinning, reverence and respect for God is renewed, and an authentic faith is rekindled. And when I preach again next time, I'm going to talk about church discipline and what that means. After the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira, I guarantee the believers took their walk with God more seriously, don't you? This couple was a warning to the whole community that phony Christians will all end up this way sooner or later. God means for his people to fear hypocrisy. He means for us to be afraid of treating the Holy Spirit with contempt. This is the lesson. Faking faith in the presence of God is a fearful thing. Faking faith in the presence of God is a fearful thing. And even those outside the fellowship took the church more seriously. Verses 12 and 13. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. They're afraid to go to church now because they know this place is different. The presence of God is there. But did that awful act of God kill the church? Did the negative publicity surrounding the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira stop the fellowship from growing? Did gossip around town about that crazy group of Christians down the road stop new people from attending? No. Verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Oh, may we live such upstanding lives that people will take note 
that all those who come to Community Church of the Hills had been with Jesus. Amen? Now, whether this message applies to you or not, it's good to remember. It's a good reminder for me to be holy because Jesus is holy. It reminds me yet again to take my faith more seriously. It causes me to confess my sin before I preach, lest I be disqualified. Do I sin? Yes, of course. But I don't want to. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, and your discipline. Oh God, may we be more faithful to follow Christ authentically so others may note that we have been with you. We love you, Lord. We commit our walk to you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.